Our scripture reading this morning comes from um, Mark chapter 4. Um, and uh, Jesus has been teaching on the lakeside and, all of, and gets his disciples into the boat to, to cross over onto the other side of the lake when this moment occurs. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Let's pray over this word from the Lord together. Lord God, we come before you entrusting our, our lives and our hearts before you, knowing that, that you hold the whole world in your hands. We recognize your, your power and authority over all things, and we trust you. God, we pray that you would allow this word to come alive for us this morning, that the story of this scripture would take root in our lives, would, would, would change us. And Lord, we pray for Pastor Mike. We thank you for his leadership and guidance, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would rest heavy upon him as he preaches your truth this morning and relays the message of the scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Morning. Um, just a couple of prefatory remarks as we go right into that scripture that Simon uh, shared with you. <clears throat> I'm a little bit masked up today, not because I'm sick, actually. I, I'm old, but that's not a sickness. <clears throat> um, uh, Monday, I think, or Tuesday, I tested positive for COVID. That's not what's in my throat right now. I think that's coffee. <clears throat> and uh, um, actually, I've felt worse sometimes when I've had a bad taco, so no need to worry about me, but... Um, we do have a, uh, you know, when we went through the reemergence, we have a way of doing things here, and so I have a few more days of wearing a mask around people, so um, I was smiling underneath it all the time. Um, I do want to say, um, as you saw Simon and uh, pray and read the scripture today, this will be his last Sunday alongside with us. Um, Simon has uh, served with us for over 500 Sundays, if you can imagine that. Uh, 10 years. Um, he's been uh, right here leading our congregation from uh, developing praise groups, uh, preaching the Word of God, even playing outside on a couple of pretty brutal hot days with praise groups down at the Cedar Rapids Memorial Ballpark, down in our own uh, park, and uh, countless things the way a person does um, in gainful employment over that many years. And, um, and I pray and believe that he's moved many people uh, closer to Christ than they were before they met him. So we certainly th thank Simon um, uh, for his ministry, and I'll invite you to something else in a couple minutes. Um, you might have looked out on the west side. Did some of you see the playground today? Yay! So, yeah. We're 90% uh, we're done with that work. Um, so there's going to be a couple different times where we still need help. So respond when you're asked. I know those guys worked from 6.30 in the morning till 6.30, or 6 in the morning till about 6.37 last night. A lot of you helped, and I appreciate that. Now as for today, 
Um, this afternoon at 3 p.m., there will be an, uh, an event here in our sanctuary. Uh, Reverend Lynette uh, Planbeck and Reverend Bill Poland will be here from the Iowa Conference Center to lead us in a group called BUMC. We know, many of you know, that you have uh, the news source of any kind that the Methodist Church is in an ongoing dialogue about what its future might be, and it's been our responsibility to make sure that you're informed. Uh, so this group is coming to give you one share of the information, so we hope you'll come. It's scheduled for about 90 minutes, but no, it's a Methodist gathering. There'll be snacks probably on both sides of it, so we invite you back. Um, back to the aforementioned Simon. Uh, some of you saw that we are partying already at 7.30 this morning. Uh, there's cake and coffee out there, and make sure you greet Simon uh, after this service if you can. <clears throat> Today is Confirmation Sunday. Behind me on the altar, you can see um, the three things that this con congregation is going to physically give to our um, middle schoolers, our seventh graders, as they're confirmed. Uh, first, you have, uh, you can see the plinth that each one of them gets there. This is the first time we've given the plinth uh, as um, uh, a blessing to the kids uh, made by Gary Garth White. They have their confirmation certificate and a brand new life application Bible uh, that is really for teens. Um, so we give them a Bible in second grade, and then we give them a Bible at confirmation uh, as well, and we encourage them to wear them out. So that's kind of the stuff that you give them. But the meat of what you as a church have given these students is, is a grounding in the Christian faith. And we've spent uh, all year in, 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 uh, at Marion Methodist with these students. Uh, they've been meeting at 915 with some wonderful leaders. And you can see their names in the bulletin that you were provided uh, this morning. They study the birth, the resurrection, the death, the suffering, the second coming of Christ. They, they study the basics of Methodism. They also talk about some of the critical issues of the Christian faith, the doctrines that we have. And we pray that that is useful for them as we come to that time when they kneel down here and we invoke the Holy Spirit move in their lives. Now, I tell you all that knowing that there's not a single one of them here yet. They're probably brushing their teeth and getting ready for their class picture at 9.30. Their parents are scurrying around trying to get a couple of them going. I'm not sure about that. But what I want to talk about this, to this group is not only your undergirding and support of youth, which is shown in, in purchasing a playground and all the things that we do here, and, and today for you, how important it is for us to confirm our own faith day by day by day, to say, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, and I intend to spend my life living with him and after him. So, so with the students, we start with this little simple question, and you need to run it through your mind as well. What does it mean to confirm? What does it mean to confirm? I mean, you can see the ritual part. You can see the ritual part up here. You can see the ritual part in your bulletin. And I do hope you take that home and pray for those 12 students that are in there. But to confirm, not only is a ritual, it's something we need to do in our faith. See, confirm means we're giving approval. It, it, it means that we're choosing this. Uh, somebody says, uh, do, do, do you uh, love Jesus? I confirm that in my life. Yes, I, I've chosen that. And, and when we confirm, it, it means that we make something firmer. It, it means that we will not back down or cancel. We will not back down or cancel that to which we have claimed. So in confirmation, I use this phrase all the time because I think it's appropriate to remember what they're being confirmed into is you, the body of Christ, adult members. So you have to make these same statements as well, at least internally. We say this statement confirmation all the time, that this is the time that you're choosing to be a Christian on purpose. You're choosing to be a Christian on purpose. You know, I always say that in relation to my growing up in the church, I had a serious drug problem, truly. I was drugged to church, drugged to Sunday school, <laughs> drugged to youth group. But those moments end today for these students, and they ended for most of you a long time ago. So when you say, I confirm that I am a Christian on purpose, you cannot any longer say, well, I'm a Christian 
because of my genealogy. My grandma was a Christian, and so that makes me a Christian. To which I normally say, Pfft. your grandma was probably wonderful, but you have to pick that for yourself. When you confirm that you're a Christian on purpose, you, you can't say that I'm a Christian because one night I was at camp, or one night I was in a youth group, or one night all of us were so emotional that we went up to the altar together and we gave our lives to Christ. I, I think those are very awesome and wonderful moments. And when you do something in an emotional state, you need to confirm it again the next morning. And the next. And the next. And when you say that I'm a Christian on purpose, you're not saying I'm a Christian because in an emergency I might need God. You can't do that. No. You confirm your faith. You confirm that I am a disciple of Jesus Christ because I believe that he's the firstborn from the dead, the only son of God. I've received the Holy Spirit and I plan to become the Christian that I can with the rest of my life. When you confirm your faith, you do it through thoughtful and thorough choice. You say, this is me. I identify, among other things, I identify as a disciple of Christ. I am a Christian. And if anybody needs to use one word to describe me, Use that one. Use Christian as the descriptor of who I am. That's what I pray for everyone I've ever met. I certainly hope that that's true of me. I would much rather be a Christian than a pastor, frankly, if you have to call me something. When you confirm your faith, you say, I choose faith in Christ knowing, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that not everyone that I know will not everyone I know will claim Christ as their Lord and Savior. And not everyone will allow me to be popular. It's not always going to be a popular way of living to say that I am a Christian. But yet, with pride, with pride, and with everything I am and all that I'm ever going to be, I confirm that this is my choice. I am a Christian, and I will spend the rest of my life praising Christ and serving humanity. Now, we're all asked to confirm or reconfirm. And here's why. Life will present you challenges that are large and terrifying. Now, that's not as shocking to those of us that have had a couple zeros after our birthdays as it might be to the 13-year-olds that are going to sit in this front row in an hour or so's time. But listen to the Scripture. As Simon said, Jesus was teaching on the shore, gets into the boat, and then there's this sentence. And, and, it, and it's different from transition, translation to translation. But the New International Version, which is the one that's in your pews, the one that we put on our screen, says this sentence. A furious squall came up. A furious squall came up. Which means there's this sudden burst of violent wind and on the way at water, when you have wind, that brings waves with it. Now, I've been to the Sea of Galilee quite a number of times. Some of you have been there with me. Some of you have been there uh, at other times. But let me explain to you a little bit about the real estate of the Sea of Ga Galilee. See, the Sea of Galilee is a really deep lake. It, it's cut into these hills. You know, those of us that live here, we, we know terms like, like West Bank and Golan Heights and, and, and uh, Tiberias and all that. But these are mountains, and in the middle of this, mountains in, in Israel terms, not mountains in Colorado terms, but big hills, a couple thousand feet above sea level, and they drop down like this. And when you have, when, when you have a real estate like that and hot and changing temperatures, oftentimes it will kick up the wind and the waves will get pretty big. As a matter of fact, in 2000, Teresa and I were on a boat in the Sea of Galilee and it was a, not, not a tiny boat like these guys were in, but, but when the wind started kicking up in the morning and it, and it started raining, I mean, I mean the, the waves were this high from the ground and that was terrifying knowing that we were just fine. I mean, we were getting a little bit moist, but, but this is what the, what the, what the disciples are, 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 are facing. And I want to under, help you understand that they're not in boats like the Disney cruise ships, right? Have you ever been on a cruise? I remember once we were on a cruise, it was wonderful. But when they um, said how many people were on the cruise, including the crew, I said to Teresa, that's more people than live in Manchester. We got Manchester floating on the water. 
Okay, it takes a pretty big wave to move Manchester, right? It takes a pretty big wave. So that's not the kind of boat that's on the Sea of Galilee that Jesus is in. These are small boats, and so the wind is pitching them around, left and right, up and down. And it's really scary. It's really scary for the disciples. You see how they reacted. They're afraid. They think they're going to die. And they're all fishermen. They spent their, their life on the water. They, they shouldn't be afraid to get in the drink a little bit. But they're terrified. Now, it, we respect wind. We really do in Iowa. We don't live in fear of it. We, we know what derechos can do. We, we know what tornadoes can do. We know the damage that wind can, can, and we respect it, and we protect ourselves. We go down the basement, all those sorts of things. And when we look at the scriptures, we, we, we have to take ourselves away from that a little bit because they didn't have those kind of physical protections that we have now. And it's very important for us to see what's happening because more than one thing is happening on that sea. Jesus physically calms the sea that day. He stops the waves he stops the wind. That is for sure. There is no question about that. It is attested to throughout the gospel. And his message is much deeper than a meteorological event. It's much deeper than weather. That was easier to say than meteorology. So, Both times. Huh? In fact, the furious squalls the furious squalls, the huge and terrifying squalls in our lives are rarely windstorms. We've lived through a couple windstorms, but the furious squalls in our lives that are large and terrifying are typically much more personal and much more unseen than a windstorm that blows through. Everybody sees wind, rain, and waves on a body of water, the, the, but the large and terrifying challenges that life presents you specifically are often just yours and so many times nobody else even sees them no, nobody else can even see that they're there and they're tremendously large and terrifying challenges for you <clears throat> there are all these challenges of person versus person that people don't even know about and we wonder to ourselves when we're in the midst of those that furious call will will things ever work out here Will we ever have peace between the two of us? Or, or we worry, you know, when we talk about our relationships with people, will I ever feel included? Will I ever feel safe again? Can I achieve or greet happiness in my life? There's these large and terrifying challenges. You know, so, you know I'm going to deal with a bunch of 13-year-olds later. You know, one of the scariest things for a 13-year-old is to talk about their own mortality. You know, they start to see it about then. I mean, they're invincible, but they start to see it around there. And they ask the questions, well, what? This is a scary thing. What happens? I mean, first, how does the world go on without me? And secondly, what happens to me? What, 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 is, is what you've been teaching me in confirmation just a bunch of stuff to make me sleep better at night? Because some of us can't sleep through the night because of our fears of, our mortality or what's and you know some of us and of course these guys you know that have gone through three school years with, with some semblance of this around here they're saying well if we get past this when's the next virus and some of us that are you know older and we don't want to be you know constrained all the time we say yeah when is the next virus it, what's that going to do to us here and here and, and we look at the waves of, uh, of, and the furious squalls that come up in our lives, and, and so many people, and, and certainly some of us are waist deep in this all the time, that we're struggling with our own mental health or, or the mental health of someone that's so dear to us, and yet so many others can't even see, see it, but it's a large and it's a terrifying challenge for us. It's a huge squall in, in our lives, and, and of course, most of us, and maybe more at this service than later, we wonder about this there's this furious squall going on in our lives to say, will, will I have enough money and will I have enough health to last through the end of my life? Th these are large challenges that terrifying 
force. These are our furious squalls, and they can be large and, and terrifying. And I say to you, as I speak to you this morning, they require us to confirm our faith, to, to literally stand up and say, faith in Christ is enough for my life. Faith in, life is en- in, in Christ is enough for my life. You know, I'm going to talk to these 12 kids later today and, and say, today, as you're confirmed, and I'll probably say all their names, and I pray for you and we pray for you, I also pray that all of us, whether we're part of the church online or the church in this particular building at this particular point in time, I pray that all of us reconfirm our faith, that we really reach down and we don't have to reach back into our our young adulthood or our childhood and say, I really believe in Jesus, but I do this right right now. And when we reconfirm our faith, we can know this, that the Lord Jesus cares deeply and has the power and inclination to calm your inner and outer challenges. Now, I've said for a long time that I'm really just kind of a high-priced youth pastor and I'm going to prove it right now. And you're going to help. Because I want you to do two things. There's going to be a call in a minute. When I raise my hand, I, I'm, going, I'm asking you all, I'm politely, when I raise my hand in a minute, will you please say, Jesus, help me. Let's practice. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you to do it like we're in a little bit of a trouble now. Like, not just, oh, Jesus, help me. It's, Mike's going on and on. Um, I mean, Jesus, help me. I'm in a storm. So now let's go, you know, something like, for me, it would be like, Jesus, help me. So we're going to try that again. You ready? Jesus, help me. Okay, that sounds a little bit more immediate. Now, so now you have, you have the end game. Now, here's the start game. I'm going to have to ask you to put down your phones, quit posting on Facebook for a minute. Um, <laughs> Put your purses down, because we're going to need both of our hands. And what we're going to do, and I've only done this a million times with students, is we're actually going to make a little noise here. I don't know how well those of you on the church online will hear this, but just do what I'm doing when I point to your section and keep doing it until we stop with Help Me Jesus, okay? All right, I'm going to start over here. Take your hands like this, everybody. Everybody get your hands ready. This section over here, we'll just do this. Go fast. Okay, watch this. Keep doing this. If you're, if you're over here, keep doing this. Over here, some of you are going to be challenged, and if you can't do it, I do. Keep doing this. Keep it going. Now to our thighs. Now with both feet. The youth do it way better. (laughs) But you see, doing that little physical example, and I'll tell you what, we would have rocked the old church, but if you ever want to see a picture of the old church today, ask me, I'll show it to you. You don't want to be in the old church right now. But the concrete floor is a little bit harder to make noise on it, isn't it? But the storm just comes across that lake. And when the disciples call on Jesus, actually they say, don't you care if we drown? which is a different way of saying, help me, Jesus. Jesus gets up, and he simply says, peace, be still. And what happens there, and what you witness here, is the Lord being the Lord over all the natural elements. He stops a storm with a word, peace, be still. And he is showing us not only, not only does he calm the storm on the sea he calms the storm inside the disciples life did you see what i'm saying he 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 is the lord over the natural world and the spiritual world his as well so the point of all that is in your challenge call on his name call on his name in the midst of it for for the disciples that storm was calmed and it would not be the only physical or spiritual storm in their lives. They witnessed the power of Jesus. 
They witness the fact that he can. He can say, and the storm goes away. They witness that he can, and they witness that Jesus has inclination, which is to say he cares and he will. So he has the inclination and the power. He cares about our storms. He has the will to stop them, and he does it. He cares, and this is so important, and, and I bury this into the hearts and the minds of young people. And I think we as adults need to have this buried in our hearts and mind as well. We need to understand that Christ our Lord cares about us. He cares about your largest and your smallest challenges. He specifically cares about those things that specifically matter to you. So don't hesitate to call on him ever. We know and believe that he's faithful. We know and believe that. When we confirm our faith, we're saying we trust in that. When we say, Jesus, I believe, we trust that you are faithful. And last, recognize and acknowledge that Jesus brings calm to your world and give him praise in your living. The disciples were afraid of storms. They should be afraid of storms. They were fairly unprotected against them. And at the end of the storm, they were still quite a bit confused as to who Jesus was. They didn't understand their eyes. How could this man calm the storms and calm our hearts at the same time? We don't have the same excuses that they have. We have knowledge and understanding of the suffering, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Fear is to be taken to him, and he can defeat it. He is our calming factor. Jesus is the calming factor of all the world. We simply need to take our fears and apprehensions to him and not be afraid about that. Confusion can be set aside because he brings calm in the midst of our challenges. And the appropriate response to that, whether you're 13 or 13 plus, is a life of praise and faith. So here's our opportunity today. For my confirmation class, for your confirmation class, today is their day. Today is the day where they'll come right up to this spot, kneel on that altar that's just on the other side of the communion font, and confirm their faith before God's altar. They're going to say, such as it was, by their action and behavior, I am a Christian on purpose. Adults, we can say the same thing. We can confirm the very same thing. In these moments right now, we can say, uh, God, I again confirm my yes to you. I am a Christian on purpose. I did not get here by accident. I did not click onto my computer screen by accident. I came here because I am yours and you are mine and I'm grateful for it. Now, if you're a person that's inquiring, you've never been confirmed or you've never made that, that decision for Christ, you can claim it for the first time to say, I, I want that. I want that calm. I want that calming factor in my life. The confirmation moment is, I think, a precious one, which is why um, I, people get on me because I am a high-priced youth minister. I'm one of the few senior pastors that really, like, control the confirmation. Usually that's for, you know, a youth pastor in a church our size. But I just think it's so important because today what I get to do here is, and what we do, and, and what is for you as well, is when a student kneels down here, First, we say their name. We say, well, remember your baptism and be thankful. And then we say their full name, those names that are printed in the bulletin. And then we say, and I say it to over you, over all you, this invocation. The Holy Spirit worked through you, that being born of the water of baptism and of the Spirit, you may always remain a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're confirming. We're saying, I am a Christian on purpose because I invoke the Holy Spirit in my life day to day that I might be a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I praise you and honor you as a congregation for your support of the youth and the children of this church. And I am grateful that you have a depth of relationship with Christ that you know, you know, from time to time, you have to renew that. You have to renew your vow with him. And I pray that you can do that now. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we pray this morning. We pray courageousness and faithfulness into the lives of these young disciples. We pray for courageousness and faithfulness in the hearts of all disciples in this church and those beyond us. 
We ask, Lord, that their faith and our faith might continue to deepen day by day and that through everything, through it all, we might have complete, utter, total dependence on you. This is our prayer, Lord Jesus. In your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.